Um, but we had uh, Emily Quano, Penn Lowe, um, Tim Fisk from the Alliance to Develop Power, and Asa Needle speaking on behalf of Stone Soup um, about the concept of the solidarity, green solidarity economy. And um, I think that the panel did a fabulous job of really framing um, how you build a solidarity economy in relation to practices of conversation and community building. And that, that to me is one of the things that came out of the session is that you know, if the economy is not simply a force that's largely out of our control, um, then, then in many ways the conversations that we have around the economy we'd like to have with others plays a huge and fundamental role in shaping the kind of economy that we'll get. Right, so on some level, I think um, you know, being, being very intentional about um, what kind of ethics um, animates that conversation that we have about the economy uh, it becomes fundamentally important. And so the solidarity economy concept, as Daniel Teagle explained, um, is founded in relation to ethical principles, solidarity being one of them, um, you know, co-responsibility being another one, uh, a tendency to emphasize cooperation, uh, a desire to privilege um, people and planet above profits is another way that people think about it. Um, so that, that to me is one aspect of sort of practicing solidarity economies and building that language is to think about the relationship between ethical commitments and economic relationships, whether it's exchange, meeting your own needs, organizing enterprises, directing finances, constructing markets, or the public provisioning of services. Right? Ethics can be a part of any one of those aspects of the economy. Um, but you know that, that to me is a part of it. And I think the other part of it is uh, how, we, how we measure and value our economic lives. And I think it's in this context that mapping becomes really kind of relevant. So what I was hoping to do with this session um, is just have a kind of conversation about the value of mapping and census work. And so the reason why I was hoping Emily um, would participate in the session, and I'm glad that you have, is that both she and I have been involved for the, how long now? <laughs> Too long. Yeah, a, a, the past year and a half, um, writing a National Science Foundation grant. And the title of the grant is a collaborative research project. Is that it? Proposal? Do you remember? We had to include this language of collaboration. Apparently, the, the National Science Foundation is really interested in solidarity, too. And then the subtitle is Mapping the U.S. Solidarity Economy. <coughs> um, so this project um, involves a collaboration between five different academics. I'm one of them. I work at Worcester State. Emily works at Center for Popular Economics in, at UMass. Um, Craig Borwick is at the, in Philly at um, I'm liking Haverford College. Haverford yes. College, thank you. Um, our colleague Malia Safri from Drew University in New York, and um, Mariana. Mariana Pavlovskaya from Hunter College. So we see political scientist, geographer, geographer, economist, economist. Um, so in, in the project, what we're proposing to do is to kind of identify the elements of the solidarity economy that we would like to map. Uh, in each of these communities, in Philadelphia, and New York, and actually at the state scale in Massachusetts. So that would be you know, a variety of things, work cooperatives, mutual aid societies, barter networks, all those sorts of things. Uh, and then sort of a second component beyond the map is a kind of um, census, where we would ask entities that are a part of the solidarity economy questions about their economic activities, where they get their inputs from. Uh, what kind of impacts they have, who's involved in making decisions about how a cooperative business is run. Uh, so the map and the census combined gives us a sense of the scale of the solidarity economy as it presently exists in our economy. Right? We're trying to, to map something in order to bring it more fully into being, but our presupposition here is that we already have practices that are solidarity economy, we just don't call it that yet. And we would be having a very different conversation if we were in Daniel Teagle's uh, Brazil, the other person who Skyped into our presentation uh, this morning. Right? You know, there, the, the concept of solidarity economy has been in use for a while. Uh, this, you know, it's actually, you know, there are 
elements of the Brazilian state that have tried to support the solidarity economy. And you find a very similar situation in Italy, Spain, uh, and France, uh, and, and uh, Quebec. And really, you know, there are sort of allied concepts like the social economy, um, where again, there's a kind of a connection between um, uh, uh, state support and uh, these various initiatives. So our hope is that on some level, if we can graphically represent the solidarity economy through the map, if we can get a sense of their impacts through the census, uh, we're also planning to use a quantitative analysis software called Implan to really look at the kind of multi what's, what economic, uh, economists call the multiplier effect of businesses. All, like how when they generate economic activity, how that creates demand for additional services. Um, and then the last component is uh, a, a qualitative research component. It's actually going out and interviewing people who participate in uh, community financial organizations or cooperative businesses or bar networks or mutual aid associations. Um, and we're casting the net pretty widely. So the question I'd, I'd like us all to consider together, and I don't, you know, I'm not really invested in this conversation going on forever, but I, I think it's one worth having, um, is what could we do with that kind of information? How could it really help uh, build a solidarity economy? And in, in particular, um, you know, maybe there's a connection there uh, between this effort, whether it gets funded or not by the National Science Foundation, uh, and a group like SAGE. Right? So SAGE has been going now since 2007. It was originally called the Worcester Green Jobs Coalition, but Basically, the idea was it was an organization of organizations, a network of, um, of, of um, community groups and social enterprises and cooperatives that had a shared vision about a, um, a green economy in Worcester that was also inclusive. You know, and as some of the speakers spoke this morning, you know, mentioned um, that green economy idea kind of got picked up by the Obama administration, but it, it sort of died on the vine. I think there's all kinds of reasons for that. Um, a lot of it had to do with how it was framed, I think, in right-wing talk media, right? Like, Van Jones was literally ridden out of town on a rail, uh, thanks to people like Glenn Beck. So I don't want to paint a rosy picture of this. I think it, it's difficult work to have these kinds of conversations. But on some level, if we can really think about um, we don't just have our words, we also have things that we can produce and then show to other people, like say, John O'Dell, for instance, um, that might, might make a difference. And, you know, and I say that knowing that he, he in, the, in, in his position as the city energy um, person has, has been thinking about the roles that maps can play. Right? So like, that's a conversation we can actually have. So I have been involved in organizing this conference since you see, April, and um, for the last two months, it's involved meeting right Asa, at least mm -hmm. once a week for three hours, and and I think one of the consequences is that I'm completely out of energy, and beyond <laughs> beyond making the statement and saying, hey, we have this project, and we'd like for people to be involved with it, I'm not sure what else to say. So the so the question so the question now is. Um, what kind of useful conversation can we have? I'm just going to let that. How do you see a role for other people outside those who are written into the grant? I have my answer. Emily, do you have one? Do you want to start? Sure. Um, so at this, so so here's what we have developed so far. Um, we have a survey. Which um, I was going to show you with the PowerPoint uh, thing. Yeah, it's in draft form. It's going to get piloted this coming week in Philadelphia. There's a, a pilot project. So they're going to test out the survey. It's online through Lime, Lime Survey, I think it's called. Um, they're just testing it with like five groups. I think they're co-ops. Um, they're going to interview all those folks um, and see what the problems are. And then they're going to go back, hopefully work out the kinks, and then we'll be ready to go. Um, so I don't, I'm not sure what the timeline of that is. So eventually we'll have a survey that um, if, if folks wanted to coordinate with a national effort, then you know the more the merrier. Right? We just need to make sure that we're coordinating. But the, even before that, just compiling a list of solidarity economy practices and enterprises would be great. 
So we'll, we will approach, um, you know, on a national level, we'll, we'll approach various federations, like of worker co-ops, of uh, some producer co-ops, of uh, community development credit unions, et cetera. But on a local level, there's a lot of things that folks know uh, that, that we would have no way of knowing. So just getting the, the most basic information, the name of the uh, entity, who the contact, the address, the phone number, what they do, and we're, we're, we will set up a, a, probably like a Google Doc, where if you want to help just compile those potential survey recipients, um, you know, you can just, we can get you onto the Google Doc and you can add the information. That's a really easy thing. Um, the other thing, is, I, don't, I don't remember, do you have a Worcester map already? I can't remember. Well, you know, last year when we, we this is our second go around with the <coughs> conference, and so far I think it's really exceeded my expectations. Uh, but one of the things that we wanted to do at that conference, and it's funny how the same ideas just keep recurring, uh, was to use a uh, mass collaborative mapping uh, program called um, Ushahi, from, uh, based on the Ushahidi model. Um, and that's sort of a, you know, a crowdsourced map where people can um, basically self-identify on the map and put up data points. And, you know, some of the mapping initiatives elsewhere in the world of solidarity economies involve self-reporting. Um, others go through a filter. And I, I forget which countries. I think Brazil is more volunteer. Right? Am I right about that, Emily? Uh. And, and the Italian map is sort of more like um, who you know in the network is what allows you, you mean to volunteer involved. in terms of how you Like you just, you self-reported. No. Brazil's the most it's sort almost, of that's formalized. That's centralized one. Because they get anyway. state yeah. funding. <clears throat> yeah. They actually okay. have people going out conducting, I think the first go around, they did like uh, hour long, two hour long interviews with like 20,000 enterprises. Right. So well, we're that's not what Daniel mentioned this morning. He yeah. said 30,000 initiatives yeah, now and 3 million people yeah. participating in so, Solidarity Economy. Especially if you understand Portuguese, you ought to check out that map. It's just unbelievable. You can do so much with it. And so one of the things that they have is you can you can say, say you're looking, say you are make you bake cupcakes and you want to find a Solidarity Economy supplier for flour and sugar. And so you can go and you can look in your, say your geographic area, and type in sugar and type in flour. You can find all the solidarity economy suppliers of those things. And then in turn, your main inputs are listed. So if, if you are selling something that somebody else can use, um, you can connect really easily. Yeah, it's amazing. Yeah. So I mean, they made the choice in their map to limit like the top three inputs that your uh, business needs, for instance. But again, the, the, you know, the purpose there is to think, OK, here's somebody who has a large-scale demand for something that I'm producing. So it facilitates in-network exchange. And I think that's part of the power of map plus census. It equals a different way of constructing markets. So I know John has his hand up, and you had your hand up first. And I don't. I guess I'm since I'm sitting here, I guess I'm nominated as facilitator, too. <laughs> well, we could be less formal than that. Uh, OK. Um, I had a couple questions. One. Um, how will this identify <coughs> alternative economic structures, and particularly the ones that have had enough time to, quote, be successful? Um, uh, some of them, it'll be too early to say whether they're successful or not. Mm -hmm. The second question is, um, will this mapping in some uh, capacity identify how many times uh, a dollar, for say, at least in this economy, circulates within a community as compared to a capitalistic structure? Yeah. Well, so I think on some level, we've chosen to use um, categories that we're getting from repess. Am I right about that? No? No, because repess is happy enough to to take whatever is going on okay. on the local level and feed it into the repest global map, right. um, whatever our categories are. So we we actually, you know, our categories right now that we're starting with, there was a small group of us that met for a total of probably over 20 hours. Um, at, 
going painstakingly through uh, worker co-ops, consumer co-ops, what kind of consumer co-ops, what kind of producer co-ops, under what conditions are we going to include these? So it was really painstaking. Um, but so, and it's not a, not a done deal, right? The first round will be the first step, and then from there, hopefully, we'll enlarge. So, you know, but the question you raised about, like, the longevity or relative newness of an initiative, um, you know, that's the kind of thing that could be included in the survey. I think we do have yeah. that basic, like, how long has, have you been around? What's your output? What's your, how many uh, employees do you have? What's your payroll like? So we'll have some kind of indications of how long they've been around and, you know, how many people do they employ yeah. and, and stuff like and that. The, and then the implant software, I don't know if it would give us a sense of how long a dollar circulates in the local community, but that on some level it's supposed to be designed to, yeah. to look at and quantify in monetary terms the impact of the solidarity initiative. And then the limit to that is, of course, if you're dealing with things that are largely not in the market, um, you know, I don't know, like efforts of environmental conservation or daycare cooperatives that are outside of the market sector, you know, things, it, things like an implant software to look at economic impact, they're not going to capture that, which is why interviews are also important. But, but again, the hope is that when you, when you produce a map that has all of those different kinds of data coming into it, what you would get is a kind of robust representation of the solidarity economy. So I just want to keep coming back to like why that would, why that might matter. Because yeah. I, I have trouble answering that question <laughs> myself. I, like I, I, that's why I wanted to organize this session. Like, okay, now we'll know. And John, you have your hand up, and then, and then we can go to Steve. Um, first, I, I, along with the other uh, things that Emily had mentioned about the inputs and outputs of enterprises within the solidarity economy, one thing that I thought was really interesting in the census, I helped write the online version of it, not actually write the questions, but just get it on the internet, um, was asking about waste products and waste streams, and seeing if uh, you can keep that internal to a uh, solidarity economy network as well. Um, which I think brings in a nice element of sustainability and, and more systemic thinking as well. Um, I'm wondering if uh, to having having the identifying criteria for groups instead of groups identifying criteria collectively on their own, if that becomes too exclusive and, and limits what could or could not be considered solidarity economy. Um, I, I, I've done a lot of reading on it recently, and, and the idea of um, self-reporting to the solidarity economy large group uh, or community of solidarity economy, and then the level of their acceptance of you as an enterprise, determining the relative strength of your solidaritist activity, I guess. Um, I think that is significantly harder to map with, but in terms of inclusion criteria, I think it makes more sense. Um, but the value of a map, the way that I see it, is first to show where these things are and concentrations of where these things are. So you can see geographically, like, is this serving you know, primarily uh, upper income, predominantly white neighborhoods, or is this serving people in uh, working class communities of color, or like, wh where is this, where does it exist, first of all, who does it serve, second of all. Um, I struggle around measuring the actual economic impact of it, because it's still putting things in dollar terms, and, and in terms of, of the dominant language, when I think part of the point of solidarity economy is to move past the dominant language, and move past the dominant framing. Um, but that said, you know, if you can show that money starting at point A in a solidarity economy supply chain results in this much money or this many jobs or this much whatever else at the end of that supply chain, um, you can demonstrate like a, a significant amount of, of strength, ideally, um, that already exists within the solidarity economy. Um, instead of having to justify it a little bit more, you just say, look, it's there and it's, it's, it can do this. Two, two things, I just realized. Is there a scribe in the room? Yes. Oh, there is, okay. And then, just a process point, because I, like, I, I really, um, in the spirit of solidarity, uh, since this is mostly conversation and none of my, co my technology is cooperating, I had 
apps. I had the census so we could actually look at the questions I could pass around my computer. But do you think we could real quickly circle the yeah. room? Yeah. Like why not? Pop in. Uh, we also need to ask some people to join us in our monthly meetings for their perspectives that are part of the solidarity economy. Um, so that's that's number one. Um, we're, we're, I'm interested in the research design because when there has been a state commission to study public banks and they said we don't need one on the North Dakota model because we have all these quasi-public agencies that deal with infrastructure and CDAC to help set up daycare centers and all these things. But we want to go around and find out in these sol the solidarity network are the people that may have applied for funding that didn't get it. We need a list of dollar grants asked for, communities from which they were asked for, whether they're low-income communities, where they're located geographically, um, so that we can say, look, if we did have a public banking, you're saying everything's fun taken care of, but this is evidence that it's not taken care of. Um, so we need that. Um, Steve, could you also just say a little bit more about the North Dakota, North Dakota oh, okay. bank? Well, just that, that bit that you shared with me on the way back from lunch about how they do indirect lending. Well, it's a partnership, yeah. Well, that's what we hope the Massachusetts model is going to be. It will be a partnership bank that won't make loans directly. It will work through local community banks and CDFIs and perhaps CDCs to some extent, some CDCs. Banks. And Possibly, or they're limited now, what, to 18% that they can make commercial loans of their... I'm not aware. Yeah, they do have a limit. It used to be 12%. I don't know mm -hmm. where it is. But we want a partnership with these organizations. We don't see using the, the state money, whether it's income tax money that's being held, whether it's pension fund money, or money raised through state bonds. Uh, we don't see that... Um, might, somebody would come to them and say, we want to start this co-op. We need $3 million, and the community bank only, only has enough, it's capitalized to only make a $1 million loan. But it could say to us, instead of, if it goes to Bank of America and it says, can you back us up, Bank of America says, sure, and takes over the business out from underneath them. But the Bank of North Dakota says to the, the local private bank, uh, or, you know, the, or, or um, credit union or CDFI, yeah, we'll, we'll back you up. You do the loan, you service it, they're your customer. We've done our due diligence. We think this is a good group to support. You know, it meets our criteria as an independent agency. Our board has approved this. We'll back you up. The state will stand behind you. So um, that's the way uh, most public banks are set up to function, not as a direct banking competition with small banks or CDFIs. But, uh, you know, it seems to me you're actually giving us an answer to the second question that we're supposed to be considering in relation to all sessions here, right? Are there ideas or initiatives addressed in your session that could be expanded to include or support other aspects of the solidarity economy? So I don't even know if we really thought about that, that the map could actually be useful for complementary or different, I don't want to say alternative, <laughs> financial institutions to direct investment capital. Like, so for instance, and I'm just, just playing here, right? Yeah. I, I was having a conversation with that woman, Lowe, who's in Boston, I think that's her name? The sh woman with the short, spiky blonde hair, who was on our previous Lori. session? Lori, sorry. Lori, Lori, yeah. Right. And um, uh, so she was talking about starting a recycling cooperative. And I was telling her about um, METEC, which is a, a big in, uh, waste rec waste reclamation plant in, uh, just down on 146, actually kind of down the street from Walmart. Um, and it's you know a conventional capitalist enterprise, so far as I know. Um, you know they're employing I don't know how many people when we were there. How many people did you say were there? Do you remember? Um, um, I don't know. I mean, it looked maybe, like 20 or 30 people. Yeah, at, at least, least. Although and the guy who, who was leading us kept saying this is a very small margin of business. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. So you know, 
like we, we have a we have the emergence of a reclamation economy here. And I guess I was just picking up on something that Jonathan was saying. And I, I wonder what other businesses could be started that would help New Tech to do what it's doing, or maybe to transform the way that it does business. And so maybe that connection here between a census map and then thinking about where we would like to see investment capital flows. That's that's a that is a practice of solidarity. Um, I have a question stemming off of that. Um, Beyond just identifying the different inputs and outputs that each enterprise on the map uh, may have or need, um, is there any effort being done that anyone's aware of to actually create the supply chains and like foster the business relationships directly uh, between different organizations, or is it mostly like give the information, let things play out as they need? I mean, the example that people give of like cross-sectoral development of a social economy is is what is happened in Quebec. Um, and I, I don't I guess that has to do with their organizational history. Um, there's a woman named Marguerite Mandel who's written a great bit about that. But that's as much as I can say about it. I don't know. I mean I don't know if we thought In the United about States that. I don't think that there's a lot um, going on. Um, but there is a way in which, you know, if uh, if you have a business that is a solidarity okay, work co op. Um, and they're looking for inputs. I mean, the inputs are going to be specific to that particular business, mm -hmm. right? So, it's a, I mean, by providing the information about who are the potential suppliers, is you're halfway there. And beyond that, you're gonna they're gonna have to figure out like at what price, you know, under what conditions, you know, all those things. Those are nitty gritty things that I don't know that you can really manage from from afar, right? Those are business decisions. I guess I'm trying to think about it in terms of like a business network, like or an association of like small businesses or something like that, um, where there are a set of shared resources and, and whatever, but also within the solidarity evaluation system. And I, I mean, so that could work both ways, right? Like, so even even something as pedestrian as Valley businesses alive for a local living economy, like that could be a resource for us or for anyone who wants to be involved in the mapping projects. And recruitment was sort of the ulterior motive for this, by the way. Um, you know that you could you could use their I guess database to really think about who might be important to include on the map, um, and maybe in the process of doing it, uh, you know even if it's just informally, you could say you know these connections should get made. Right? That's, that's that kind of conversational model that we've been discussing. Mm -hmm. I've thought of a couple of things just to throw out there. One is that you know the mapping project can be a value because it's kind of like the temperature gauge in watching the pot boil. You know, so it's like if there's this idea that solidarity economy is happening but we can't see it yet, or that we think it can go to a scale where it would uh, in some more substantive way transform or challenge the current uh, what we have, then you might, you know, it's not necessarily linear and the map helps, you know, so it's like, you know, you don't know that a pot's going to boil until you start seeing the bubbles, but if you watch the temperature gauge goes up, that gives you a sense of, of progress. Um, but then I think, so, so to me that's a bigger scale, like, you know, you're talking about a big map or, or maybe you can think about it in regions too. Um, and then I want, and then I think about it the other way around, which is that if you, let people self-identify. It could be a real movement consciousness building tool where just by asking yourself the question, is what I'm doing solidarity economy? And that in itself is a really right, valuable, and you can engage somebody by saying, we're doing this mapping thing, are you a part of it? So if that identification process gets people to go through mm -hmm. like, mm -hmm. Are yeah. we doing this, that, or other thing? And, and maybe we're, we're doing almost all of it, and we just had to push ourselves to think about our yeah. connection to somebody but, else. But like you said, for that question to get answered, it first has to be asked. And for me, what that ends up raising is like, because I, I think like we've kind of come at this in the researcher mode, right? And then there's that alternative that people think of as crowdsourcing using mm -hmm. social media. And so what I, I'm wondering, uh, this is honestly, you know, wondering, like, is there some kind of preliminary work that could get done mm -hmm. through that self-identifying, self-identifying, self social media-driven crowdsourcing that could that could be useful, like immediately for Sage, 
for Worcester County, you know, and, and again, kind of selfishly for our research project, and then maybe we can pass the information along to someone starting a, say, a public bank. Um, I don't know. I think um. uh, Judy was, I guess in my facilitator role, Judy's had her hand up for a while, then Asa, then, oh my God, I'm Sean. Sean. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. 